Our reading this morning is from Ruth chapter 1, We've got verses 15 through 21. For those who don't know the context, Ruth and her husband Elimelech had left Bethlehem because it was a famine and gone to the land of Moab, where their sons had taken wives from the local community. But both sons had died and Elimelech had died. And Ruth was left all, or Naomi was left all alone with her daughters-in-law, Orpha and Ruth. Orpha has gone back by Naomi's direction to be with her family and possibly be remarried again someday. But Ruth has told Naomi she will stay with her as they return back to Bethlehem in search of relatives to seek shelter with. In verse 15, we pick up. So Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you, to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do thus to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, call me Naomi no longer. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? When the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Naomi and her husband leave during a famine, leaving Bethlehem, a town which literally translates as house of bread, because there's no bread anymore. They go to a strange land, and things go well for a while, and then it falls apart. There's word that the famine has broken, so Naomi is headed back home, but with a broken heart and a foreign daughter-in-law along for the ride. She has no idea how she'll feed either of them. I challenge you to find a sympathy card to give to this woman. Seriously, fold a thick piece of paper in half, plaster a picture and some fancy words on it, find a piece of cardboard with some old cliches. None of them are going to work. So we'll have to write our own, right? We can't find one at the store that meets this moment. For that time when you lost your entire family and wandered back into the demons of your past, wondering if you would survive, God bless you. Hallmark doesn't make that one, do they? So what do people usually say in a moment like this? What would we write on our card? Oh, you had to move from home due to a famine? You poor refugee. But home's a people, not a place. Don't you feel better? Your husband died while you were living in another country? Poor widow. But don't worry, God has a plan for everything. Both your sons died while you were grieving your husband? Poor mama. Don't worry, God won't give you more than you can handle. Seriously? We don't have an answer for these questions, do we? None of this is going to work. But with Naomi, I'm not sure it has to. We discover there's a lot more to her. She's a survivor. She is a powerhouse. There's something about her that makes Ruth want to hold on to her, even going into the unknown. This woman is hurting, she is grieving, and she is broken. But this is not the time to cheer her up. 
and it's not the time to tell her how hashtag blessed she is. She has two wonderful daughters-in-law, one so devoted she won't go away. But this woman's not ready to hear it yet. Sure, Ruth came along, silly girl hitching her wagon to a train headed over a cliff. That has to be how her mother-in-law sees it. Yeah, she's going back home, but not with the people that made it special. Her world has fallen apart, and so she says, call me Mara, which means bitterness. Call me Mara. Not Naomi anymore. Naomi, interestingly enough, has its own meaning. It means pleasant. Hmm. How many women in the world have felt the pressure to be pleasant all the time, even when they're really Mara, even when they're feeling awful bitter? Our society today values pleasantness above so many other things, including reality. I think pleasant might be an English word for act like people want you to act and swallow your truth. Pleasant is how we pretend to be instead of naming our hurts and our truths. Pleasant is how hurt people comfort a society that can't handle their emotions. No, no, no. There's no Naomi here today. Sorry, church. We're dealing with Mara. Mara is the woman in our scripture, bitter and real. She tells the truth. How comfortable are we telling the truth? What's your mental health condition right now? Today. It'll change. It will. It'll evolve. It'll shift. It will. But there's great comfort in knowing our status in the moment, knowing how we're doing. It's like looking into a mirror and seeing who you really are. Now, it's harder than it sounds. There are days we all feel like a stranger is staring back at us in that mirror, and we don't want to see it. There's comfort in knowing who you are. My wife has been going back and doing classes in marriage and family therapy. One thing she's discovered through the pandemic is that her congregation needs a therapist as much as they need a pastor these days. And so she's working on that skill set. She's taking that college degree in psychology that she set aside to go into ministry and dusting it off. And one of the things she realized along the way, re-engaging old material now with a theologian's mind, putting that doctor of ministry to work, as she reads back over old psychology notes, is that Freud and Genesis had some similar thoughts in mind. Back in Genesis 2, when God forms that person, that first person out of the mud and breathes into them, that word for the breath of God is divine spirit. The word for the person's breath is nephesh. It's the breath of God that is a human soul. In German, when Freud talked about self-reflection, seeing yourself, the German word comes from nephesh, to see your own self, to see that God-made self looking back at you. That was Freud's identity and concept of therapy, of talk therapy, of counseling from the beginning. The idea that caring for our mental health is an opportunity to look at ourselves in the mirror and know who we are and how we're doing. To go, oh yeah, yeah, that's me. Oh yeah, talks too much, yeah, that's me. Yeah, a little nervous about crowds, yeah, that's me. Whatever it is for you, that's me. To see it and to recognize ourselves, to get to know ourselves. There's comfort in knowing who you are. Being able to look in the mirror, though, can sometimes be harder than it sounds. There are the days when the stranger stares back and we realize we have work to do. But there is comfort in knowing who you are, but also risk, right? To figure out who we are, we have to talk to others, 
We have to engage in the world, and we have to look within. We have to share our truths with others, get them out of the echo chamber of our own minds. We also have to see how others see us. We have to listen to them so that we can kind of test our assumptions to figure it out together. But it all starts within. It all starts with some truth-telling. We have to wrestle with our questions. We have to face our feelings. We can't be afraid to say, nope, nope, call me Mara. This is where I'm at. Lucky for us, there is an entire professional support system designed to help us. Sure, our healthcare system may not want to pay for it and limit your number of counseling sessions. Sure, your friends may give you the side eye and have a little bit of stigma around mental health, but there is an entire mental health community out there ready to help us. And some of you even work within it. And lucky for us, there is a spiritual community that's ready to be part of the journey. Having a community that's ready to listen and support can be powerful. This is the one-year anniversary of us voting to be a wise congregation during the mental health network of the UCC. Welcoming, inviting, supporting, and engaging. We promised to make mental health something we would talk about all the time, which wasn't hard because we do it anyway. We promised to make mental health something we would support in others, their journey, their self-care, which is good because we do a lot of that anyway. You hired a minister with a neurodiversity. You have leaders throughout the church with their own counseling stories and mental health journey. This is a community ready to support our truths. But first, we have to make a choice to be known by ourselves and by others. We must choose to be known. So how well do you know yourself these days? Are we ready to set aside the public face and see ourselves? Or are we acting pleasant even in the mirror in the mornings? How much have we been pushing aside, burying deep, thinking we'll sort it another day? How might it feel to feel real instead of feeling Naomi, instead of feeling pleasant, instead of just being fine? How might it feel to really feel instead of numbing, pretending, or medicating? How might it feel for others to see you, to feel known, to feel seen? If no one else, if by no one else, by you, to be seen by yourself maybe for the first time in a while, and if by no one else, then seen by God, seen by God, to trust that the one who breathed that divine breath into you also celebrates that soul that breathes in and out and returns that breath into the world. Naming our truths can be hard. It can feel like the last thing we should be doing. We're told to be strong for our family when things are hard. We're told to push through to our happy place. We're told to do a bunch of stuff that will make others feel better, but won't really heal us at all. Repression has no positive therapeutic benefit. None. There are only two sets of creatures on the earth who get PTSD. Human beings and domesticated animals. Wild animals don't play that game. They get all the trauma out. They get the energy out. They run. They shout. They howl at the moon. They live their authentic selves, no matter what the other critters might think. Even if they scare the other animals by shaking, barking, shooting their quills, flapping their feathers, whatever it is, they get it out. Humans bury it. And it does us no good. What does? Sharing emotions openly, even if others are tired of hearing them. Openly naming our fears and our hurts, even if it makes others uncomfortable. Even if it makes us uncomfortable. Openly stating the sources of our pain, even if society is not ready 
to change. If we say it enough, it becomes real to us and we have to deal with it. If we share our truth enough, it becomes processed along with our emotions and our experiences. If we share our truth enough, it becomes part of the public conversation and change is a step closer. Who do you think talks more about responses to gun violence? Victims or gun advocates? Victims are burying their feelings and sharing their story. Others are telling us who to be afraid of. Who do you think speaks more about sexual assault? Victims or those who don't want their liberties trampled and don't want to have to self-reflect on their own behavior? Victims are always hesitant to share. We're processing guilt. We're processing shame. We're trying to figure out what's new and what's normal. We're dealing with a trauma, and everybody else that would rather our trauma just go away is happy to discuss it and talk about how it's not that big a deal. Folks, we have children shooting one another, and we have people shooting children on their own porches for stepping into the wrong car, for going to the mall. We have been through so much in the last four years. We had a pandemic that epidemiologists were expecting, but no one was ready for. And we did what people do. We tried to figure out who to blame when it became too difficult to deal with. And we're still dealing with it. We're still dealing with it. Sure, the numbers may have gone down, but as Nora's told us, the restrictions are off now. Things are fine. So if you get COVID at the prison, you're just allowed to share it with everybody else and let everybody still get sick. People still get long COVID. People still die. Our compassion fatigue has set in, and we're not using what we know to be rationally accurate about mental and physical health to make choices. We're doing on what would make us all feel pleasant. At least those who have the privilege of pleasant. There are difficult issues to face in our world. There are real things to be afraid of. In the last four years, we've made each other the biggest monsters, biggest boogeyman. We've quit talking to each other about our truths, and we felt like we couldn't share our stories when we've been hurt. Our society has taught us for so long to stay quiet about our pain that those who've been hurt the most don't have their voice in the conversation. Our nefesh, our soul, the Spirit of God that is within each of us should be shared publicly so that our truths, our spirit, ourselves are a part of this and can be taken into account, can be recognized, and we can make decisions based on the needs of all people, no matter how uncomfortable it might make us. There is a comfort in all of this. God loves Mara. God never left Mara. No matter how bitter the woman got, no matter how much her identity shifted, no matter how much they said, y'all leave me alone, no one wants to be around me. God never left Mara. God loves Mara just as well as Naomi. No matter how uncomfortable we might even be with ourselves, God's love remains. Interesting how stories tell deeper meanings. The Hebrew word for companion, Ruth. One who's with us no matter what, one who won't leave, one who stands beside. Practically in our world, we call those people family, friends, mentors, therapist, psychiatrist, pastor, Spiritually, we call this person God. One who, when all of our physical friends are exhausted, tired, or have their own stuff, will always be our Ruth. One who will never leave our side. One who will face our sorrow 
with us. One who will always know our truth and still love us. I want you to imagine Ruth's words from Scripture like they're spoken from God to Mara. Or even more so, not just the characters in the story, maybe from God to you when you feel Mara, when you are bitter, when you are frustrated, when you are angry, when you have retreated into yourself. Hear these words from God. Do not press me to leave you or turn your back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people are my people, and I will always be your God. Even when you are hurt, even when people tell you God has abandoned you, even when others tell you that God is judging you, even when you feel lost, afraid, and scared. God, your companion, will remain with you, even to the bitter end. Amen.